Okay. Um, so there is one question uh, regarding the first half of the lecture, which is, imagine the ground state of my system is a pure state. Does the coherence have any effect on, on the annealing? So it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and I think um, I'm going to, to answer it in the following way. Uh, we're going to take a very simple example where um, we're, we're going to consider a 1D example, meaning that, and here I'm going to consider a graph, which is a very simple graph, it's just a line. So I connect the vertices which are in the same line. And so for this particular example, if we are looking for the MIS, the maximum independent set, the solution is basically given by, for instance, this is one solution. So I just uh, put here, uh, so yellow on one, uh, one, uh, one vertex and white on the other. And so that would be one bit string corresponding to one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. And that's the solution for this particular graph. Now, what happens when we have decoherence is that, well, the final state uh, typically will not be this one. So in other words, there will be defects in this perfect chain. And so, by the way, this kind of chain here is something that in physics you probably have heard uh, another name for, which is just anti an anti four magnet, right? So in other words, this would be up, down, up, down, up, down. So in 1D, um, uh, the maximum independent set is, is the anti four magnetic state. And what decoherence is going to do is that it's going to break this perfect state because you're going to basically lose information. And, and so, so this is not a very precise answer. And to be more precise, uh, you could just first look at some numerical example uh, to try to, to, to look at the quality of the solution versus uh, the noise strength. And what you see is that you do degrade the quality of solution as you increase uh, the, noise, the noise strength. And now, in fact, um, it's a very good question because it's going to help me introduce um, uh, an important aspect, uh, which I promised I would talk about, which is the link between the coherence, the cor correlation length, and the solution quality. So something that uh, people like to look at a lot in physics is uh, correlation functions. And in particular, if you are in an anti magnet and you look at the, at, the, at the spin correlation function, So if you look, for instance, at SZ, SZ, so as a function of, of distance, oops, zero I as a function of distance. So this is I here. So, and you look at this correlator as a function of distance, what you expect to see in a perfect anti magnet is that is something like this, where you go, you'd have this, 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 this. And now it turns out that if you add, if you add noise on this, now let's look at what, what, what you obtain. And so now I'm going to turn to exact, so, so to, to numerical results that uh, we obtained doing simulations. And so, uh, there you go. So here, uh, you you what 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 you see here is, is zi zj as a function of i, so or i minus j, uh, for for a particular example of graph, as a function of the noise strength. What you see here is that here is that in the absence of noise, we do get an almost perfect alternation corresponding to what you would expect in an anti magnet or in a maximum independent set. And the fact that it's not perfect comes from the fact that we do annealing with a finite annealing time and also our target Hamiltonian and our resource Hamiltonian are not the same. Um, and also the fact that we do a relaxation. So U is not infinity. And what is interesting now is that when you increase the strength of the noise, so when you go, for instance, to blue and red, you see here that you get something that looks like damped oscillations. At least it's kind of, if you squint, 
or stare at these uh, functions, that's what you sort of see. And you even see it better if you take the absolute value and you look at it in log scale. And, and, and then what you see in log scale is that you, do, you have a linear uh, decay, which means that there's an exponential decay of this correlation length, of, of this correlation function as a function of distance. And if you now uh, do a fit of this correlation length, uh, of this exponential, the exponent uh, that you obtain here is usually called the correlation length. It's called psi, psi here. And so, and you see here that the larger the noise level, the larger the decay as a function of distance. Or in other words, you see, and this is something that you would have more or less expected, and that also more or less uh, answers your question. As you increase the noise strength, your your correlation length gets smaller and smaller. Or in other words, as you increase noise, you kind of destroy the nice pattern that you had created by doing your annealing. And now what you can try to do is, is, is do the same procedure over and over again for different si system sizes. And what you see is that basically the correlation length doesn't depend on the system size, but it depends quite strongly on the noise level. And it, it, and it, de it decreases with noise level. Or, or in other words, if I increase the phasing noise, if I increase the coherence, I have a correlation length which shrinks. Uh, which, which shrinks. And so now to, to explain a bit more and to try to gain some intuition, Let's go back to uh, the notes here. So you have to imagine that, for instance, the fact that you do that you have decoherence will mean that basically, uh, if you have a long chain like this, uh, for for some length, for instance, here, you have a perfect antiferromagnetic ordering. But at some point, because of decoherence, you're going to break this order, and then you can start again with with a good antiferromagnetic and so on and so forth. But you see that from time to time, you may have defects. So here you have perfect antiferromagnetic alignment, here perfect antiferromagnetic, but here you see there's a defect and here there's a defect. And the typical size of the chain where you don't have defects is called the correlation length. At least that's how you can have an intuition for what this correlation length is. And basically noise, Will is going to 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 decrease the correlation length, uh, so which is more or less what you would expect from an intuitive point of view. But that's what we see in the numerics. And in fact, we can even be a bit more quantitative. Uh, and and here's how we're going to do. So typically, um, so if if I look at the real definition of the correlation length for two observables A and B. The correlation length is defined in the following way. It's defined as, as a, a length psi such, such that the difference between these two expectation values. So here I do, so you can call this AB, and this is here BA. So this is AB. And the correlation length is defined as, as something like some factor exponential of minus d between a and b and xi. And you have to imagine that a and b are two observables sitting on two sides and the distance between these two observables is, is called dab. And the, the, the definition of xi for those two observables, so xi depends on which pair of observables you're looking at, is defined in this way here. And that's a very important definition. And in particular, you see that when xi is larger than the distance between a and b, then you have that a b equals a b. And now, so this is something that you probably know. Um, but now let's try to think of what is the kind of state psi such that this is correct. And now my claim is going to be that, in particular, this is correct for a state for states of this following form. For instance, a state which is psi a tensor phi b. Typically, you see that states which are not entangled between the two subsystems. So the subsystems were a leaves, and the subsystem were b leaves. If the state is not entangled between the two parts of the system, then 
then I will have that the 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 so I, I I obtain this result that I'm not correlated. So in other words, the fact that I have a finite correlation length from an intuitive level point of view means that roughly speaking, my state is going to be a a, a, a vector a, a factorized state between islands, so between states which are correlated within the islands or or entangled within the islands, but not entangled with uh, with the other islands which sit at a distance more than the correlation length. So, or in other words, you can have this following picture in mind: that if you if this is your system, basically the fact that you have a finite correlation length means that you have patches here. And each patch has a has a typical distance xi. And with the, within each patch, there is entanglement. But between two patches, there is no entanglement. Of course, this is all very rough and intuitive. But this is the kind of picture that you can have to think of um, of the correlation the correlation length. Now, having said that, and focusing on this kind of states, we can try to to think of if I have a state like this, what is the kind of, so of what Hamiltonian is it the ground state? Uh, is it the ground state? So uh, in other words, here, let's say, let's suppose that I have this state and I'm trying to think, oh, I, I see that my system is in this state. What is the Hamiltonian of the, the, the corresponding Hamiltonian? And here you can see quite easily that a typical Hamiltonian that has a ground state that looks like this is a Hamiltonian, which is a Hamiltonian that lives that acts only on the first system and on the second system in a separate fashion, so it's, which is separable on the two systems. So, and this is a this is here an implication. So, in other words, if my Hamiltonian is like this, then my my ground state is going to be of that of that form. It's going to be fact, factored between the two uh, between those two uh, those two parts. So, why 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 am I am I saying this? I'm saying this because we can use this basic intuition to try to directly have a link between the quality of the solution and the correlation length. Let me be more precise. So here, let, 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 let me remind you what was our, our Hamiltonian. So our, our Hamiltonian, the, 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 the resource or the target Hamiltonian doesn't really matter because we suppose they're close, um, but we can have in mind the resource Hamiltonian, for instance. We had we had seen something like it was minus that, that it was omega over two of some of sigma x my sorry minus delta times sum over i of n i and then a term n i and j and some coupling term g i j between both. So this was the form that I had for my H resource Hamilton. First, I can notice that these terms here are all single side terms, so they do not create any entanglement. The only terms, the only term that creates entanglement is this term here, which has interaction between particles or interaction between Rydberg atoms. So this is the Van der Waals interaction. And now I can try to do something, namely I can try to split this Hamiltonian in Two, two different terms, which is going to be a sum, so a sum of terms which act only within patches of a given correlation length, and then terms which couple two patches. So I'm going to, to separate the Hamiltonian is sum over k of h of k, which is basically within a patch of size xi plus h, which I'm going to call h border. And basically, you see that what I put inside this h of k is all the terms, the, the rabi and the tuning terms, and most of the terms of the van der Waals interaction. And h border is going to contain basically the rest. So or in other words, if I, if I put colors, oops, not the same colors. So here, inside. So the, the H of K, I put what is inside a patch and inside the H border, I'm going to put the terms that connect two different regions. 
So this is this is the, the small model I'm going to do. And now what I can do now is define. Uh, so this is, I made no approximation at this stage. I just separate, separated my Hamiltonian in two terms. And now I'm going to do an approximation where I'm going to neglect edge border. Or in other words, I'm going to, to define a Hamiltonian H, which is sum of K of HK. And I'm going to call it mean field because in a way this is a cluster mean field Hamiltonian for, for the experts. And what you can see is that if I now look at this uh, Hamiltonian and I and I find and I try to find the ground state, well, then I know that the ground state of such a Hamiltonian is going to be some psi phi that lives on a on a patch psi product, some phi that lives on patch phi, psi, and so on and so forth. It's going to be a product state over these different Hamiltonians. Okay, now maybe you're you're wondering what I'm driving at by by doing all this construction. Now let's let me consider this state, which is not the solution to my problem. It's an approximate solution to my problem because I neglected the terms of edge border. But I, I here I suppose that edge border is like negligible for now. Now let me try to compute uh, the cost function psi h target psi for this. My claim now is, so that's my score. So, so if you remember the notation that I used in the very beginning of the lecture, my score, uh, which I can call score tilde because I, I removed so, some, of the, so, some of the Hamiltonian, my score is going to be this. So if you want, I could call, call it psi tilde, psi tilde here. What you can see, or what you can more or less have an intuition for is that this score is going to be something like the perfect score, meaning if I had kept the border minus some contribution that I'm going to, to call S border, which is which is the contribution of the border. And and as you so I put a minus sign because I know that the score I'm going to get with this Hamiltonian is not as good as the score I would have gotten if I had not neglected the border. So here I'm just using notations to, to, to use this. And now, of course, what I'm interested in is trying to have an intuition on what is S and what is S border. So S, uh, and this is something where you're going to have to believe me, but uh, S as a function of the, the system size N, it is well known that the size of the maximum independent set is, 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 is on average proportional to the size. So I'm going to call it kappa times n. So it kind of makes sense. The larger the graph, the larger the maximum independent set is going to be. This is a, this is, this is a result that you can check also by, 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 by running the exponential algorithm and looking at the average size of the maximum independent set. So this is something that is quite well known. So now what we want to understand is what is, this, what is the, the border, the contribution to the border. And there's something where um, probably, uh, uh, so you you have you'll have also to to believe me a bit is that s border um, is going to be proportional to the number of sites on the border, and it kind of makes sense because. It's, it's the same rule, more or less, as what we said here, that the size of the, of the independent set is proportional to the number, to the number of sites. But that, that is an assumption that I'm going to use. You may or may not agree. It just agrees with the, with the later data. So it explains the numerical data. But that's a kind of reasonable assumption. And now we're going to really count the number of sites in, in the border to make a connection to the correlation length. So let's, let's do this. So let's suppose that we have we have n sites. So so here I have n sites, and I know that I have a correlation length psi. So what does it mean? So so it means that so the number of patches, m patches. So I have m patches here, and the number of patches is of course n 
over psi, which means that basically my border, S border, is going to be also something like, so let's suppose that pro the proportionality factor is called mu. It's going to be mu times S times N over psi. So that's something that is quite reasonable uh, to assume, at least that's the simplest kind of um, uh, rough estimate I can get. Basically, the size of the border is going to be uh, this number here. And this is for 1D. And let's look at what happened. what's happening in 2D. So in 2D, uh, we have a big system here, and we have patches like this. And I want to estimate what is basically the, the size of the border here. And so the size of border is going to be so the number of patches. And so the number of patches is n over, so in one patch of size psi, I have order psi squared sites. So this, the number of patches is n over psi squared. And then how, and then if I have now one patch, the number of sites which are on the border is of order psi. So in other words, if, if I have a, a, a surface uh, of area psi squared, I have a perimeter of psi, which gives me n over psi as well. So that the size of the, the total size of the border is the same as before, it's also n over psi. So whatever happens, I have an, uh, an um, I have a, a S border, which is N over Xi. And now we can put all these results together. So if we look at this result here, Kappa N and S border N, we can now compute the quality of the solution as a function of the system size. So let me recall that the quality of the solution is S tilde over S, namely the, 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 the solution where I have some mistakes, so some finite correlation length, over the solution where I don't have mistakes. And, and we just saw that it was S minus S border divided by S, which gives me one minus S border, which is U and psi, divided by kappa times N, or in other words, so the n drops out, and we see that we have 1 minus mu over kappa over 1 over xi. And this was alpha. So you see here a very uh, uh, interesting result, where we have made a link here between the quality of the solution that I get with my quantum computer as a function of the correlation length in my system. And what you see here also is that when psi goes to infinity, so when I have a very large correlation length, alpha goes to one, which is what you expect. If you have a perfect quantum computer, then you have a, a very nice score and it does a very nice job at solving your problem. And if psi now is smaller, then of course you have an approximation ratio which is smaller than one. But in other words, from an experimental point of view, it means that if you want to get better results, you need to increase the correlation, the, the effective correlation length in your system. And now there is something that is not clear yet from a research point of view is what is the precise link between um, the noise level and the correlation length. The only thing that exists today, to my knowledge, is that you, we 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 check by numerical simulations that as you increase the decoherence, you decrease the correlation length, but the precise link between both uh, quantities is not correct. Is not is not really known. Is not is not known ana analytically. Okay, so this concludes uh, this part on optimization. And so here you've seen really the link between what decoherence does, meaning in practice decreasing the correlation length 
and the quality of your solution on the quantum computer. And those results have been uh, illustrated here for optimization problems, but similar reasonings uh, would also work for quantum chemistry or quantum physics problem that you would try to solve on a quantum computer. And now what I'm going to do is switch gears and try to tackle a, 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 a problem which might look similar, which might look very different from, uh, from, from what I just did which is try to understand how to simulate very big and noisy quantum computers. So that, that will be the second part for the last half hour, uh, for the last uh, hour. So how to simulate big, noisy quantum computers. So in other words, and that's the link between the two parts. How do I use the fact that, that Xi is finite to my advantage? And of course, I don't claim I'm going to show you a, a general answer to this, uh, to this question, but rather give you uh, a strategy, uh, one, one possible strategy to use this. And uh, to as an appetizer, uh, the kind of big noisy quantum computer I'm going to try to simulate uh, is is going to be a superconducting qubit processor, uh, such as such such as the one that Google produced. Uh, and in particular, what I have in mind is a, ver a very famous experiment of two or so two and a half years ago by Google on on a on a on a processor called Sycamore with 53 qubits, which you probably all have heard of. And, uh, and but before uh, maybe I go into the detail, I'm going to explain a bit more to you what, what Google tried to do. So what they did was take uh, their, their, their processor with 53 qubits, and they run uh, circuits on these processors, which are random quantum circuits. And these random circuits uh, are quite simple to understand. Basically, what they did is they did random one, cub one qubit gates followed by two qubit gate patterns, like this, for instance, and like this. And then again, random one qubit gates, and then entangling gates like this, like this, and so on and so forth. And they repeated this several times. And so they repeated this for, for, for several times. And then at the end here, what they did was measure uh, the final state on their 53 qubits. And when you measure a state here, you get a bit string. Uh, so a bit string B1, Bn. And what you can do is a histogram of the bit strings. So now let's take a look at. Uh, so let, let's try to have an intuition of what you can get when you do a histogram of the bit strings that you get uh, on such a, a quantum computer. So first, I'm going to do a histogram here of the probability of of the bit strings probability. So that's something quite, I mean, not, not that easy to understand, but so let's try to do it nevertheless. So here, what I'm really doing is a histogram of the bit string probabilities. So other, in other words, I'm going to see how, ma how many times I get each bit string. And I'm going to then collect the number, the frequency of appearance of each bit string and put it in the histogram. Let's look at a very simple case where I have a very, very bad quantum computer. In this case, I know that what is going to be, uh, so the state that I'm going to collect at the end of the computation is a completely random state, a uniformly random state, in which case all of the bit strings have the same probability of appearance. And, and since they, this probability of appearance must sum to one, I know that I'm going to get one huge peak here for one over two to the power n, 
where one over or where n is the number of qubits because the, 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 the total number of bit strings is two to the power n. So this is if I have a very bad quantum computer. Now, um, if, if, you, if you happen to have a computer which is perfect, so if you have a perfect quantum computer and you do a random circuit, what you get here before the measurement is a state psi, which is a, a completely random quantum state. And you can prove that if you have a random quantum state, the probability distribution here is a, a very special probability distribution, which is called the Porter-Thomas distribution. Porter Thomas. So Porter Thomas here, which is which has the fo following formula. Porter Thomas is two to the power n exponential of minus two to the power n times p. So this is the the curve that I drew here, and this is a very special distribution. So. Um, I don't really have the time here to do the proof of why you get this distribution, but uh, so if I have time, maybe in the end, I will, I will do it. But you see that these are very different distributions. And the goal of Google's experiment was to try to see if they were closer to the black curve here or if they were closer to the red curve. And if you want to measure the distance between two quantum states, there is one uh, there is one uh, there is one quantity that people like to, to like to look at a lot, which is called the fidelity. And the fidelity f between two states, psi and psi prime, is defined as the squared overlap between those two states. And so roughly speaking here, what Google wanted to do was to get a, an estimate for psi uh, true or phi real, so what they really have in their quantum computer, and psi perfect, which would be this perfect uh, Porter-Thomas distributed state. So this is what they, they wanted to do. And, and so they got a number out here, which is f. So f is a number. And they wanted to compare this quantum computation to a classical computation. So, so the game they propose is, can you do a classical computation with quality, so a quality of the sampling f? So that was the game they proposed. On the one hand, they do a quantum computation where they output bit strings and they get a certain quality f, and they do it in a certain time. So that's the quantum part. So quantum is I do bit strings, I compute bit strings with f, with the quality f, and I report the time, tau, quantum. And then they, they ask classical computers to do the same thing and to report the time it took them to do the same task. And it turned out that Google claimed that they had done this task in 200 seconds and that the time it would take for a classical computer would be 10,000 years. So that was why Google then said, since it takes 10,000 years for a classical computer to do what we did in 200 seconds, we have a very good quantum computer which has quantum advantage or quantum supremacy. Now, why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you all this because now we're going to use the fact that the fidelity that Google got was very small to design a simulation strategy that can catch up with Google's results in a lot less than 10,000 years. And, and as you will see, there will be some links with the finite correlation. But first, we have to understand something which is uh, some many so which is uh, overlooked or, or neglected in, in most talks about quantum computing, which is how sensitive quantum computing is to decoherence and to errors in general. And here um, I'm going to, to to we are going to do a, a multiple choice question, but first uh, let me uh, maybe set the stage for this question. 
Let's suppose I do a quantum circuit with gates uh, U1, Um, and meaning I get a final state psi, which is Um, U1 applied on the initial state. This is my setting. So I have M gates. And it turns out that for each operation here, I suppose that I have I, I make some errors. So I have I have a finite fidelity for each gate. And let, let me call small f the fidelity of each gate. And now let me call big F the total fidelity. And the question that I'm going to switch to right now is can you do a guess of, can you guess what is the finite, the, the, the total fidelity or the final fidelity uh, as a function of small f? So the fidelity of each gate, if you have m gates in your program. So just to have an idea and to, to set the stage without any proof, but so here is just to, so that we start getting an intuition of how sensitive quantum computers are to noise. Okay, let's see. Okay, so apparently there's a there's a great majority of people who say that it's f to the power m, which is the correct result. Um, and now, um, what I'm going to do uh, is maybe uh, let's try to. So I propose that we don't uh, try to prove this result. Uh, if we have time at some point, we can do it. But I'm going to, since everybody found the answer, we, I, ex I expect that it's something that we don't really need to prove. So uh, let's, let's keep uh, this in mind. And now we're going to, uh, instead uh, of... of um, so let me... What we're going to do is try to get an estimate for Google's fidelity if we use this very simple law. And so for this, I'm going to go back here. And I'm going to, we're going to, to more or less guess what is the result that Google get, got in terms of fidelity. And here I'm giving you a few more data. And the data are the following. So Google circuits has, a thousand one qubit gates, a bit more, thousand hundred and sixteen, with an error rate which is zero point sixteen percent. And what I'm telling you, in addition to this, is that small f, so the fidelity is one minus the error rate. It also has four hundred and thirty two qubit gates with zero point sixty two percent error rate, and also it does fifty three measurements with three point eight error. And the question is, can you give an estimate of the total fidelity using uh, the formula that we uh, learned about in the previous uh, question? And so, and here I give you a couple of choices. And so here, if you have a, uh, if you have a Google access or whatever, you can do the small multiplication, or you can try to guess uh, what is the final result uh, that one gets in terms of fidelity. And I'm really talking about fidelity, namely a quantity that would be 100% if you have a perfect quantum computer and 0% if you have a very bad quantum computer. And something you can notice also, which is interesting to see, is that here the main source of error or, or the largest error source in terms of percentage is the measurement error. And this is something that is quite important to have in mind when you're doing, when you're doing superconducting computations. The measurement error rate is much larger than the one qubit error rate and the two qubit error. So you don't want to do an algorithm which has many measurements. Okay, let's see what we get. Okay, very interesting. So um, let's check what is the right answer. So the right answer is this one. So it's 0.15%. And it's quite shocking. I mean, it's very interesting that you had quite diverging opinions on what the answer would be. Um, and so, okay, 
the first remark is to get this result, what, what you can do is, is just say, um, I have one minus 0 0.16% to the power 16 times one minus 0 0.66% or so times 140, and then you do one minus 3.8% power 53, and you will find something like 0, 0.15%. And so this, so of course, Google did much more sophisticated experiments to compute this kind of number. And what they actually found in the experiment is 0.2%, knowing that what they computed was not really the fidelity, but something they call the cross entropy benchmarking fidelity. But so it's, it's not very important at this stage. What is important to understand is that the fact that the fidelity f is f to the power m is very bad for quantum computing because what we learn here is that the errors accumulate in an exponential way. The more operations you have, the more noise you have, and the, or the less quality, and this, is, this comes with an exponential in the number of operations, which uh, is a fact that not a lot of people are aware of, and that that's also a fact which you should motivate you to listen to David's uh, lecture tomorrow because it's going to, to tell us a bit how we hope to get out of this problem with quantum error corrected computers. It also shouldn't uh, depress you too much about what we can do with today's quantum computers. It means that there is an exponential somewhere, um, but that doesn't mean that you cannot get uh, some acceleration which is not going to be exponential most probably, but you might get some exponential with today's computers by being clever about what you're doing. But if you really want to get some real acceleration, you will probably have to wait for uh, long-term computers. But despite this depressing growth here, uh, we are going to continue and, and, and then try to use this in order to do simulations. But for this, we need to find a way to do simulations with a finite fidelity. Here, what we learned is that Google has a very bad fidelity of 0.15%. And what we would like to do is a simulation strategy where we accept to lose some information because we can lose some information. And, and the loss of information is going to represent some loss in fidelity, so we're going to, to to, to degrade in a, so voluntarily or, or on purpose our simulation. But we can do, we can afford to do this since Google simulation is not perfect. So the goal here is going to do a classical simulation. With finite fidelity. And so far what we've done what we've seen in the lecture so far is that we could do a simulation of a noisy quantum computer by, for instance, simulating the Lindblad equation. But in a sense, this, this simulation was a perfect simulation because we, we, didn't do, we did a perfect simulation of the noisy quantum computer. We didn't break anything in the, quant in the simulation. We didn't do any assumption or approximation in the simulation. Here, instead, what we want is a, is, a, is a slight, we have a slightly different goal where we want to do something to simplify or compress our simulation by accepting to throw away some of the information, but not too much, but in such a way that at the end, the, the, the quality of our approximation is going to give us a 0.15 fidelity. That's the goal that we set for ourselves. And for this, we're going to remember a bit how uh, what noise does to a quantum computer. And what we saw in the previous part of the lecture is that noise basically kills entanglement, or it, or it creates a, a, a finite correlation length, or it kills entanglement, which means that the states that live in a, quantum, in a noisy quantum computer are states which have a finite degree of entanglement or a lowered degree of entanglement with respect to what they should have, that they should have in a perfect quantum computer. So that one idea that we could have using having this in mind is that we could use states that have a small degree of entanglement. And so why, why, why would we like to have states with a small degree of entanglement? 
The, the reason is the following. So, um, if I have a state, for instance, let's suppose that I have n qubits. So this is n qubits. And I want to store the wave function corresponding to these n qubits on a classical computer. Then what I need to do is write decompose psi as a sum over k, an index k from 0 to 2 to the power n minus 1 of an amplitude a, which depends on k, times k, where k is, is, a, is a one of the computational basis set. And if you want, you can think of k as k1, k2, kn, where each of the ki's can be 0 or 1. So you see that that's basically you decompose your vector on the Hilbert space of size to the power n. So and and the amplitudes likewise you could decompose as a k one k n. So that's what people. That's what you usually do, if you want to simulate the Schrödinger equation. You need to decompose your state on your classical computers with a big vector of size two to the power n. And the way that people represent such a such such a number a of k, so a of k can be seen as a big vector of size a, two to the power n, or you can see it as a tensor with n entries, and each of the entry has two values. So that's why people like to to represent this kind of state, and that's what I'm going to do here as a big potato here with n legs. So here there's n legs, so one two, three, four, until n. And each leg here is, so that represents k1. And k1 can be 0 or 1. And for instance, kn can be 0 or 1. So a, a is, and this is, this is here a of k1, kn. So this is how people represent the state of a quantum computer. So it's a big, so that's what people call a tensor. And this tensor, uh, here represents fully the wave function of my quantum computer. But now, let's suppose that my quantum computer has no entanglement between two of its subparts. So let's suppose that instead of having one big quantum computer, I have a small quantum computer with so n here and n half and n half. And there's no entanglement between the two parts of my quantum computer because it's a very bad quantum computer where all entanglement has been destroyed between those two parts. Then, as you know, I can write my wave function as psi a times psi b. So times here is the tensor product. And in this case, you can show that a of k1, kn can actually factor as a of k1 until kn half times a of kn half plus one until kn. So this is a fact so this is the definition of a factor or a factorized state or a product state. It can be decomposed as psi a tensor psi b, which means in terms of amplitudes, that the amplitudes are are factored, are uh, can be factorized. And if I write it in terms of tensors or potatoes, it means that I can separate this as so one until uh, until n half and then n half plus one until n. So basically, the fact if I have no entanglement between the two uh, between the two parts of my system, I can break up my big potato, my big tensor, into two tensors. Why is it nice in terms of classical computing? It's because if I now count the amount of memory I need to store this state here for this potato, I need two to the n half complex numbers or complex amplitudes and two to the n half for the other one, which means that the final price that I have to pay is two to the n half plus one. And as you know, it's much, much lower than two to the power n, which was my initial price. So in other words, what we learned here is that if there is less entanglement in my system, and here I took a very, uh, tough case where there is no entanglement between two subparts, the, the, the cost for classical simulation is much lower. 
and I'm going to 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 use this a lot in the in the future. And now, of course, some of you might tell me, yeah, but you've been quite uh, uh, you've been quite nasty with your quantum computer if you suppose that there's no integument between the two parts. And indeed, maybe we should be a bit nicer to the quantum computer by supposing that by not supposing that there is no integument, but supposing that there is not a lot of integument between the two subparts. And for this, we need to use uh, something that you probably you you may have seen in, in in the textbooks with which is called a Schmidt decomposition of the state, which is a very simple mathematical operation, where you take your Amplitude, a k1, k n half, k n half plus one, k n. So you take the tensor corresponding to your state. You group the indices together. So here, instead of viewing your amplitude as a multi-index tensor, you can view it as a two-index tensor, where I can call this alpha and beta. So in other words, my tensor became a matrix, which I can draw, for instance, as a as a potato here with two indices alpha and beta. And then what I'm going to do on this matrix is an operation that is well known uh, in applied math or in linear algebra, which is called a singular value decomposition. And the singular de value decomposition, I can write it here in, in the standard form, is you take a matrix A, I, J, and you split it in U, I, k, s, k, v, k, j, dagger, in, with, with, U, with u and k having some properties, but we don't really care about those properties right now. And the s of k are called the singular values. OK, and I can nevertheless tell you that u, dagger, u is identity, and same thing for v. So that's that's the that's what the SVD does, and we're going to apply this SVD uh, to our special case. So here we're, we're going to say it's sum over k of u alpha k s k v dagger k beta, and then once we've done this, we could also rewrite psi, which was sum over. Uh, sum over uh, alpha beta of a alpha beta alpha beta we can rewrite it as sum over k of sk of sum over alpha of u alpha k alpha times sum over beta of v dagger k beta times beta so here i just plug everything in my equation here. And now I can put all this together and that's psi k, then some, some psi k which lives on subsystem A, then psi k which lives on subsystem B. Oops, like this. And this is here and this is here. <laughs> Okay, so now let's let's see what we got. So you see here that I split my state in two with coefficients here that correspond to the singular values in my singular value decomposition. And something else that we can know that, that is well known in the SVD is that the number of non-value or non-zero keys, so number of non-zero SK is the rank of the matrix, is the rank of A. So in other words, SK is the rank of, of the matrix that I created by looking at the, uh, by splitting the coefficients in two. And so, and something we could look at is what is, what happens when the number of, num of non-zero K, so the number of non-zero K equal one, or in other words, if rank, of a is one, then what we obtain is that psi equals basically psi one a, psi one b, which is precisely a 
factor state, a factorized state, which means no entanglement. So here, what we see by doing this small mathematical ma manipulation is that the entanglement in the wave function is directly linked to this rank of the matrix, or in other words, to, to what the singular values look like. And if you have only one non-zero singular value, then you have no entanglement. And that's a very important result that we can see in a bit more uh, illustrative way. So here, what we did is we had b1, bn minus 1, bn half plus 1 until bn. And what we did here is a decomposition where we decompose it as the matrix here u times s times v dagger here with the coefficients b1 until bn half and here bn half plus one until bn. So we split our wave function in two parts. And sometimes what people do is that they, they put u and s together. So they, they basically do, a, they, they, they define this in yellow to be only one matrix which we could call, for instance, u tilde alpha k. And then if you do this, then you obtain basically two potatoes, u tilde v dagger. And that's the Schmidt decomposition. And what is important to understand is that the dimension here of this link here is the, directly the rank of the matrix. And there's one case which is very extreme, which is if rank equals one, then you see that there, you can write it as two potatoes, which I have no link together. Okay, any question maybe so far? Because so this is, so basically the math of, of this section is, is basically all here, where what we've seen is that we can decompose any state as a sum of product of matrices and the number of terms in this sum. In other words, so the sum I have in mind is really this sum over k. And the number of, sums of, of terms in this sum is linked to the rank of the matrix or the number of non-zero singular values. And that's most of the math that we need for, for, for this part. Okay, and so let's try to make it a bit more concrete. So if I if I plot s of k as a function of k, so there's one there's one case which is very simple is that is if f, s of k if, if if I can have one and zero for all the rest, then that means that I have a factor state, a factorized state. But I could have a case. For instance, like this, where I have something like this, something like this, and then this wouldn't be a factor state. So this would be an entangled state. And now why am I telling you this? So I promised you that what we would do is try to have a simulation method where we could throw away some information in in so and with a link to entropy uh, to entanglement to to entanglement and to correlation length one thing that i could try to what i could do and that's probably the first thing that comes to your mind is that if these singular values are small here in yellow then why not throw them away i could decide to say that so my state here psi is sum over k of sk psi k a tensor psi k b, then why not decide that if s is too small, then I just remove this term. So I could try to approximate this by sum over k 
smaller than a certain number chi of psi k a psi k b. I could decide to do this, right? I could I could decide to to just cut the sum in such a way that I, I keep only uh, the terms here in blue because I, I, I decide that these are my important states and the other, it's a compression algorithm where I remove the rest. Well, in essence, this is something that is not so stupid to do. And also it's interesting to see that if you compute, so if I call psi tilde this new state, I can compute the fidelity between those two states. And so let's do this computation. So if you, if you do this computation, because you have two cats here, so here alpha and, and oops, and, and this one here, when you do the, the vector product of the two, you have something squared. And you have then sum over k smaller than k of sk squared. And then all and the, and the scalar products are basically going to give you one, right? One times one. So at the end of the day, what you get is sum of k of sk squared. So you see here that, oops, and I did something wrong probably. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, yes, for, for k smaller than k. So you see here that the fidelity of your operation is going to be basically the sum of the, of the square of the histogram of your singular values, which means that the more concentrated your singular values are around uh, small, uh, small indices here, one, two, the more, so the best fidelity you will have. Or in other words, let's try to, to, to gain some intuition. If you have a state which is which has singular values s of k like this, and you decide to cut all the singular values which are larger here, you're going to be you're going to do less harm than if you had a state with singular values which are much more spread out. So if you cut here, here you cut a lot more than if you do this. So in other words, this fidelity f is, is uh, quite close to 1. And this fidelity f here is quite small. And here, this here is, is not entangled a lot, not much entangled. And this here is very entangled. And so now you might you may wonder um, how um, how entangled is Google states because this is a central quantity, right? What we want to understand is if I, if I if I if I want to do a, a, such a simulation where I throw away some of the states, I hope that the states that are created by Google have an, a histogram which looks more like. Uh, like this situation, than this situation, right? Because then, then my fidelity will be better. Well, there's something that we can that that I will not derive now, but that we can nevertheless uh, that that I hope you will believe me is that if 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 Google were perfect, had a perfect computer. then the distribution of the singular values would be a very difficult to compress. In other words, we would have something that looks like this. And this is actually more or less the reason why Google chose 
to do such an experiment. They they chose to do a random circuit experiment because one can show, and this is also something that if I so if we had more time, I would have done a small derivation of how one can compute the distribution of singular values for a random state. But what what we would have seen is that if you create a random state uh, with a so uh, with a random quantum circuit with a perfect quantum computer, you get you get a state which is as entangled as can be. So you can you get a very entangled state, and this is why Google created this this kind of state. They wanted to have a circuit that creates the most entanglement in the least time, so that noise or decoherence doesn't have time to destroy entanglement. Now in practice, because they have a noisy computer, because they have an imperfect quantum computer the distribution of the singular values looks more like this. And therefore, it makes sense to do a classical simulation where we throw away a lot of the singular values. And now what I'm going to, uh, to, to tell you about is a bit uh, more quantitative, maybe to give you a, a rough idea, is that um, you you can make a link, a direct link between, oops, between the entanglement entropy which is called S of your states and the compression level, which is which is here given by chi, which is the index after which I throw away everything. So chi is really the number after which I throw away the singular values. And um, for this, so I, I should need to to define what the entanglement entropy is. For now, what I what I suggest we do is that I'm going to give you directly the formula for S. So S, the entanglement entropy, or von Neumann entanglement entropy, is defined as minus times sum over k of S k squared log sometimes most of so sometimes in log, in base two, but it doesn't really matter, of S k. So you cut your vector in two. So you decide on the on the partition of your of your of your Hilbert space in A and B. You compute the singular value decomposition. You get the singular values, and then you compute this number S. And this is called the von Neumann entanglement entropy. And so you can see that it's it's it really looks like a Shannon entropy for a distribution P, which is in fact the S K squared. If you remember, Shannon entropy is, is sum over k of pk log pk. That's a Shannon entropy for a distribution. And here we're doing the Shannon entropy for a distribution, which is the squared singular values. And so something you could check is that the sum over k squared is equal to 1, because it's basically the, the norm of the states. So it's it's a well-defined probability distribution. Now, what you know is that if you want to maximize the entropy, the Shannon entropy, what you should choose is, is a state or a, a distribution which has no information. And a distribution which has no in information is a distribution P, which is a constant. Or in other words, it means that if you choose SK squared, a constant, or SK a constant. So if, if you choose SK a constant, then you are going to maximize the entropy. And so now I'm going to call I'm going to call this constant one over uh, one over let's say so I'm I'm going to call it one over C and I'm going to check that sum over K of SK squared uh, is going to be so, I, so to fix the value of the constant, I could I could do this, and what you find here is that you have 
So let's do let's do the computation sum over k of s k squared, um, uh, and so I have two to the power n half uh, p -p 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 -p, two to the n half times one over c squared equals one. So that means that c is 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 one over two to the n four. So, so you could do this computation. And if you do this and, and you choose this constant, then you can compute that the entropy, the maximum entropy corresponding to a constant, constant singular values, you would find, uh, if I made no mistake, that you, you would find n half. So that's something that you can have in mind. The entanglement entropy is 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 bounded by this number here. That's something that you can check at home. Now, what happens when you when you cut the singular value? So you take the singular values, and after chi here, you remove. And here we're going to take a, simp a simpler case where instead of taking any distribution of the singular values, we suppose they're constant. Suppose they're constant and we throw away everything that is larger than chi and we keep the sum of the sk equal to one to keep the normalization of the wave function. Then if you do this, that means that you should choose s of k, each s of k to be one over square root of chi. So that you can check this is what you should choose in order to find, uh, to preserve sum over k squared equal one. And in this case, what you will find is that s max equals log two of chi. Or in other words, the entropy in your system is always going to be smaller than log, log two of chi. So let us, let us look a bit in more detail at this result. It means that when you do the compression of your Schmidt decomposition up so you keep the singular values up to a value chi. You reduce the entanglement entropy inside your state. And of course, if chi equals one product state, then S equals zero. So in other words, you have a handle, which is this chi, which is sometimes called the bond dimension. And when you change this bond dimension, when you change chi and you make it lower, then you reduce the, the amount of integument entropy in your state. Or in other words, if, if we put it in a different way, we have that two to the power S is smaller than chi. So it means that if you want to have an entanglement content in your state, which is S, you need to have a bond dimension chi, which is at least two to the power S. So here it may look like it's a lot of math, but so what we can remember is the following, is that instead of paying a price for a classical simulation, which is two to the power N, which is very expensive in the size of the system, but doesn't care at all about integument. So any state will cost you a lot of compu computing time. If you use the right representation, which is this Schmidt decomposition representation, then the price that you have to pay is going to be of the order of two to the power s. So you still have an exponential. So I have I haven't cheated. The, the, the problem is still here. Only by choosing the right representation. Now the difficulty is no longer in the size of the system, which is something quite artificial. Because if I have a system of size n, but I have a lot of noise, then basically I have only classical states. So I have factorized say no entanglement so it's quite stupid to use a naive representation of the wave function as two to the power n coefficients so here i switch from a representation which is quite naive to a representation which is well which is which is good when entanglement is the right variable so said in a different way in the previous part where i talked about optimization and the effect of of uh, of noise on the correlation length, we saw that the role or what 
entanglement or uh, what decoherence does on uh, on on entanglement is that it reduces entanglement but if you use a representation of the state that doesn't know about entanglement you're still going to pay a very large price to do your simulation now if you switch to a representation where entanglement is built into the representation you can directly choose the right level of representation for a given or a suspected level of entanglement in your state which also means that the more noisy the easier it will be to do a classical simulation so that's maybe something that i'm going to write that more noise less s and therefore easier or less heavy classical representation. And this is the very idea that one can use to simulate noisy quantum computers. And that's that's what we did for, for Google's computer. And so Google's computer has 53 qubits. So in principle, you would need two to the power 50 complex numbers to simulate Google's experiment. Here, so in Atos, we have since we're building HPC machines, we have we have very big machines that can simulate up to two to the forty complex numbers, which corresponds to a few terabytes of RAM, which is already a lot. You have to imagine that on your laptop, you have a couple of of gigabytes of RAM. So here we have very big machines with terabytes of RAM, which allows us to do a brute force computation of two to the 40 complex numbers, which is 40 qubits. Now, if you want to simulate Google's computer, you cannot play this game anymore. Two to the 53 is huge. But now, if we switch to a representation of two to the power S, which is this Schmidt decomposition, then if S is small enough, because Google has some noise, then it's still OK on classical computers. And that gives us also another intuition into what it needs or what it takes uh, to, to do to have quantum advantage. To reach quantum advantage, we need to reach a level of entanglement, which is high enough that we cannot we, that we can no longer do the classical computation. Or in other words, we need to reach a S, a S star, which is large enough that two to the N star is too large to be stored on a quantum computer. So in other words, what counts is not really the size of the Hilbert space, but the level of entanglement that you're creating. And noise is fighting against you or is fighting against this entanglement entropy. So, and this is really a central message that I want to convey today. Um, now, uh, so do we have questions maybe? And then I can, I can switch to a very small conclusion. Aha, uh -huh. so that's a very good question. Um, so S in the Google experiment is not really known uh, because so to compute the entanglement entropy is actually hard. So, so this is a, but this is a great question. If you want uh, to compute the entanglement entropy in principle, you need to do something which is called um, um, tomography. And uh, just to give you an idea of what, how much it costs to do this, so if you want to do to compute S in principle, you should compute, you should have an idea of what is psi. And psi is something which has intrinsically two to the n complex numbers, whatever it takes. At some point, it's it's the kind of information that you can get. There's there's an exponential in it. And you need to do uh, you need to do an experiment to extract this two to the power n complex number. So it's a very expensive simulation. And it's, in fact, the situation is even worse because if you have a noisy state, you're no longer talking about pure states, but of mixed states, which are density matrices, which I introduced in the first part of the lecture. And there we're talking about two to the n times two to the n numbers. And you can make them re real if you want, if you go to the proper basis. But that's even worse. So if you want to compute 
to have a, to, to have an estimate of the entanglement entropy in general, it's very complicated. Uh, so we, we don't really know what it is. Uh, and it's it would be an it's an interesting research question to maybe make a link between the fidelity that that Google obtained and the entanglement entropy that they created. This is a this is an interesting question, and and probably there's also a link, or what could make a shortcut by looking at the correlation length that Google has at the, in in the final state of the experiment. So there may be ways, clever ways, to extract some information of the entanglement entropy. By looking at these quantities, but uh, but I cannot tell you much more because I think this is still an open question to 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 quantify this. And what I what I can show you, except there are questions, maybe I don't see if the the audience there are. No. So what I can show you is is actual data that we got because here you so 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 I showed you so basic uh, things uh, uh, to, to, that, that to, to derive. And here, I'm going just to conclude on a, on, a, on a few final graphs, where here what I plot is the fidelity. In fact, I don't plot the fidelity, but the error per gate, the equivalent error per gate in percent that we obtain by doing numerical simulations using these techniques of Schmidt decomposition and, and things called matrix product states, which are pretty much the same, as a function of the bond dimension of chi. So here, if I have a small chi, it means I throw away a lot of weight. And if I have a large chi, it means I keep a lot. So that means that the computation is very cheap here and very heavy or more heavy here. And if we can focus on the dashed line here. So the dashed line is the error rate that we get that we get when we throw away some of the singular values. And what you see is what you expect, namely as namely that as you increase the bond dimension, so as you throw away fewer singular values, you get better and better error rates because you throw away less information. And so you go from 5% to something down to 2%. And now what I put in gray here is the, um, the error rate that Google achieved in their, in their experiments. So the, the, Google, the rate that Google achieved in the ex experiment is 3%. And there's some subtlety between the gray and dark gray, the light gray and dark gray area. So you can ask me later, but we can say that there's only one gray area. And what you can see here is that if the bond dimension is large enough here, uh, I think it's 16 here, if the bond dimension is larger than 16, then we have an error rate in our classical simulations, which are lower than Google's. And to obtain this point here, it took us a couple of hours, which is still more than the 200 seconds of Google's experiment, except that for our simulation, if we go to 200 qubits, we can, we, we, our simulation time basically doesn't change much. It's linear in the number of qubits. Whereas for Google, they would need to do a lot more experiments. To, to reach uh, to 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 get their number out, so which means that with this simulation, where we switch to a clever representation, we get uh, we get the same results or better quality results than what Google get. And in fact, the situation is even worse if you take useful circuits. So Bruno told you that um, probably didn't tell you about random circuits, but he told you that you could do VQE where you use clever variational states to do uh, an optimization. And for these clever variational states, you don't use random states. You use very special states, which are inspired for, from chemistry or, or any intuition that you have about the, problem, uh, about the problem. And it turns out, and that's an exper a numerical experiment we did, that circuits that are used to do useful things, and here, this is an example for a, a special VQE type, which is called QAOA. Um, it turns out that for this case, the entanglement growth is much slower than for random states. Namely, Google, the coherence kills the, the computation even before or even, even faster than what they did for random states, which means that if we throw away some, some weight in, the, in, the, in our simulations, the error rates that we get are even lower are much lower than for random circuits because basically the random circuit strategy of Google is the hardest one to do with the classical simulator. 
Whereas if you want really want to do useful circuits, then we get the simulation uh, quality, which is much better with a classical computer than than with so the the equivalent uh, uh, quantum simulation. And this tells you that Google claimed quantum advantage. And for us, it was quite hard to do the same classical simulation. We had to switch to a very clever classical representation. But if you want to get quantum advantage for a useful circuit, then it's even harder to reach advantage, which doesn't mean it's it's not use, it's not possible. But then you need to, to increase the gate quality to really get to this point. And I'm going to conclude here. Um, and uh, thank you for your attention. And take any questions you want. And of course, um, I'm happy also to answer questions by email since I'm aware that this was not the most interactive way. Me, me not being here uh, uh, physically, it was not probably the best way to interact. But so if you have questions by email, I can also answer. Well, I wish you a good lecture tomorrow with Saad and David. Uh, you will learn a lot of uh, new things with them also. So yeah, enjoy the second day of uh, the school.